Hey guys, welcome to this new format. It's a bit of an experiment on this channel. It's a sort of podcast interview-like thing where I will have a guest and we will chat for a certain amount of time about certain topics. To start, we have uh, this uh, series of five episodes where we will talk about lighting and each episode will have a, let's say, part of theory where we will introduce concepts and a practical part where we will, uh, well, actually, my guest will work uh, live. Let's say it's not live, it's recorded, but uh, he will uh, apply uh, as he, he works uh, such concepts to uh, something that you can see and uh, some tangible work, let's say. So uh, let's dive straight in and I can introduce to you this old friend of mine, Eros, which is a lighting artist and also a very good one. Up to you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh... I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Eros Dadoli, and uh, as Jan Pedro said, I work as a lighting artist. At the moment, I work in uh, Massive Entertainment, uh, Ubisoft Studio, as a lighting artist. Um, and yeah, let's see how it goes. You said it again. You did it in the, in the test, but jump here. <laughs> okay, so uh, just yeah. to break the ice a bit. We we basically met in Milan. We were both working in Milestone at the time. And uh, we didn't know, though, but we were from the same region of Italy, which is not Milan. Uh, and uh, between us, we don't even speak Italian. We speak dialect. And uh, yeah. we basically... <laughs> we, we, we became friends for, from the moment we heard each other we, under we understood <laughs> each other when no one yes. else was like actually understanding us so and yes. that's why like it's a little bit strange the fact that we are not even speaking italian as you said but also speaking english in between yes it's us. very very it's so difficult. crazy i mean we yes. use it every day more likely uh, in our lives but it's strange in between us to have it like as a conversation, <laughs> but yeah, we, we will yes. make it work in a way. We will try yeah. to not go, not either in Italian, but not either like in the in the dialect version of it. <laughs> yes, let's see how it goes. Um, so, uh, you said that you're working in Massive. Uh, you worked at the recent uh, release of Avatar, and yeah, I mean, great title, but also like. Tell us a bit more about uh, your uh, career, let's say. Yeah, sure. So yeah, like I started as a hobbyist, actually. So I was working, working. I was trying stuff when I was 17 years old. And I got like really passionate about art in general since I'm a, I was a kid, even before, uh, by drawing and playing video games, movies. So it has been always something that has like captivated me. And then like by seeing the possibility that you can actually have a PC and then create something, it just made me like going mental with it. And I started to like dive into it a lot uh, until like I had the opportunity to start to work in Milestone, as we were saying before. Uh, and I started there working as a lighting and VFX artist. And it's where I met Gian Pietro. Yes, it's also strange that people hear, hear your name, right? Because yeah, you never I'm spoil it in Tecart, your channel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I met Visual Tecart. Uh, but yeah, like he has been great. And we met in there, we worked together, and we worked on several games, like for example, uh, Supercross, the video game. So uh, really, really nice experience. And after that, I moved to uh, another studio in Milan, 
where I worked as a more generalist artist, so senior 3D artist, and more particularly on VR production. So completely different per se, in a way, like still like experiences and real time experiences, but in a different way, in a different approach that was their virtual reality approach. And by being a generalist, I had to do everything in the in the show, like with all the other uh, people with who I worked, uh, we had the possibility like, to touch every side, every part of production, lighting, VFX, optimization, tools, uh, photogrammetry, photometry, uh, vegetation, modeling, texturing, whatever, <laughs> like whatever what was needed, it had uh, to be done. But that that one was the fun part of it, because by doing that, I learned a lot about production in general. You weren't getting bored? No, yeah, like, I mean, every day was something different. It was in a way crazy, <laughs> but at the same time, super, super fun. Uh, and after that, I wanted to get back to video games. So then I started to work for a studio in Dublin called Black Shamrock, a virtual studio where in there I worked as a lead lighting artist for a remastered of uh, uh, The Outer Worlds, Spacer Choice Edition. And we just redone the lighting of the game. We have remastered it. And also that one was like a really, really great experience. I mean, I first time like leading a team and working on it, uh, especially on the lighting, creating all the pipelines and production out of it and also seeing how another studio have worked and understand all the paths of knowledge that they have actually produ uh, produced and then trying to work with it has it, been a really great experience overall and then here i am now in sweden in malmö i'm working in uh, in a massive and i had the possibility to work on uh, on avatar where i worked on uh, some cinematics of the game and lighting and also in the environment, lighting. Uh, so yeah, uh, really, really great experience. And I'm really, really proud of the results that we have achieved so far. Nice. That's very, very cool. And by the way, other than that, uh, Heros sometimes does some experiments on its own and he has a YouTube channel, let's say, it's not like mine, like a structured one, it's just a dump of things. And uh, you might already know one of his videos, especially, it's the Meerkat uh, demo that uh, he released, uh, which went kind of viral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a no-sense way, completely. But I mean, in a way, I can understand it because it was really on the edge and a lot of people started to argue a lot underneath it. Like it was crazy seeing it. Yeah. So if you didn't like that uh, video and you are among the ones that uh, were insulting him in the comments, you so now you have... can close yeah. this one. No, yeah, I'm kidding. no, no, don't close. You have another <laughs> space here. You can reiterate your arguments. Your... Exactly. <laughs> Yes. You can hate me also here, incredible. Yes. <laughs> Double hating. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. So let's uh, let's talk about it. Uh, this is more for uh, for you, actually, uh, because as I anticipated in the introduction earlier, we will have for how we decided now five episodes where we will talk about lighting. And uh, in each episode, we will have a different topic. I will give you an overview so you can uh, think about if uh, the thing interests you and uh, you know what to wait for, let's say. So in this one, uh, we will do an introduction of the discipline of the lighting art. And uh, uh, we will uh, expose you to some of the basic concepts about lighting and we will dive as a practical example we will go more into the cinematic pipelines so how to make uh, cinematics how to approach the, the the lighting in that case in the second episode uh, we will talk more about the artistic uh, expression 
through lighting. So how to set the mood, how to support uh, level design, gameplay, how to guide the player uh, through the level and such uh, through lighting. So all these things that uh, rely pure on perception of the image. The third episode will be more about an analysis of the modern technologies that we have at the moment, the state of the art of things, let's say. Uh, of course, it will be more oriented to uh, Arial Engine 5 because we both work with that. Uh, so we will talk about what could be an example of a, an a lighting pipeline, how to use all the tools that we have, pro, cons, uh, things that we're still missing, uh, things that are not quite ready yet, stuff like that. The fourth episode, we will be the one where we will interact a bit more because we will go more in depth into the physical based lighting and rendering concept. We will see how shaders interact with lighting and vice versa, how the actual lights in the engine are structured, uh, how they work under the hood, let's say. And uh, we will talk a bit more about uh, performances. In the very last episode, uh, which will be the, from what Eros is saying, the, a bit, uh, the controversial one, uh, we will go a bit more low level stuff. So we'll talk specifically about the tone mapper how it works, the H uh, HDR, LDR, the conversion between the two, the pipelines, uh, how, uh, also about the philosophy that uh, the lighting artist should follow to approach his work, ray tracing, and all these, let's say, hot topics. So, that said, let's dive straight into the first one. And so, Eros. What's a lighting artist? What's light art in general? And what are we talking about in this series? Yeah, so uh, we can say like in terms of uh, production in a studio, the lighting artist is the person that actually uh, manage all the lighting side by going specifically on tools, that support lighting, cinematics that are represented in the game, and levels that are lit for the gameplay. So in terms of uh, like skill sets that a lighting artist should have, at least in my opinion, I more likely divided it like in three parts, we can say. So I divided it like in uh, communication skill sets, technical skills, and uh, artistic skills. So why like I'm dividing it in these three ways? Because for example, the three roles that are present in the video game industry, at least, for the lighting artist are the cinematic lighting artist, technical lighting artist, and level lighting artist. The technical lighting artist is really technical. So it's, for example, a person that knows how to code, how to do tools, how to interact with a render a rendering low level, not that low level as a render engine, of course, but understands the concepts and the structure of a low level uh, rendering pipeline. Then we have the cinematic lighting artist that is more specified on, on the cinematics. So we can say the translation of uh, script, narrative, and storytelling into lighting. So because we are like super focused in the scene and we have one single scene where we have to represent what is going on and the emotion that should be felt by who is actually watching that. So then we have the level lighting artist that instead is the person that is more specialized in making sure that the lighting design of the scene is in line with what the game wants to tell and making sure that everything like works together like the work of level designer the work of level art and the work of lighting should all be cohesively working together but that then i will come to the technical part 
doesn't exclude none of the roles to know all the technical side underneath it, the layer. So lighting, unfortunately, is not only a artistic role. So it implies a lot of technicality and technical knowledge that in the end will help the actual lighting artists and doing the work that they have to do. I mean, it's not that it's a co uh, something that creates boundaries, but gives them the possibility to actually develop more. By knowing mm -hmm. what is going on underneath the layer, they can create more. So that's why the technicality part. Uh, yeah. uh, on you can't just drop in few lights and call it done. Like. Yeah, exactly. So it will become uh, too easy in a way. Like it feels too easy. At least to me, it feels too easy. So it's, it feels strange by being that easy. So in fact, it's not like that. Uh, but yeah, like there are a lot of information underneath the layer. And then we have the communication skills that are really important because the lighting artists will always communicate with almost everyone in a team audio, level art, as we were saying, level design, direction, VFX, uh, propping, whatever role you can think about in a UI, whatever role you can think about, there is always a little bit, even if it's a little bit, but there is a little bit of lighting involved into it. So it's always there. So that's yeah. why and of it's course really... It, yeah, it makes sense if you think about it, because, I mean, everything you put in the scene has to be lit <laughs> exactly <laughs> as we see in real life we will not see anything if there will be no light so exactly. it makes totally sense yes <laughs> but yeah uh, it's not that obvious like in a production because you know like you know these kind of big studios where you think about oh yeah i will only do my thing and then that's it no uh, it depends on the role of course uh, but on the lighting one it's definitely not like that so you yeah. will always, always uh, work with someone else. Yeah, I personally see lighting art very, very close to tech art, to be honest. Almost, uh, I wouldn't say a branch of tech art, but uh, something very close and parallel, let's say. Uh, yeah, you have to be, yeah, middle. it's good to have experience in multiple areas. Like you said, like uh, you had the opportunity to, to be very horizontal uh, in some of your uh, work experiences and that of course helps a lot because when you're talking to people you know what you're talking about is not just oh i need uh, this thing yeah but <laughs> you don't understand yeah <laughs> oh no, yeah there is uh, always uh, a basic layer that is really horizontal and then of course uh, there is a verticality into it like we were saying mm -hmm. specific rows with specific like verticality but still it's really horizontal and you can see it like uh, uh, there are people online that have represented it, but probably we will speak about it later. And we will also take a look uh, in the, in some scenes and in all the lessons that we spoke about so far. Cool. So let's start with some hands-on stuff. And uh, actually, let's do like this. I will open Unreal on my side and I will uh, be like the generic person that uses a real and has to start doing some scenes and uh, has to do the lighting too. So uh, let's go and give me a second. All right, I have uh, my completely dark scene now. And uh, I will do what I will do uh, if I needed some lighting in it and I want because I want to start working and seeing something actually. So what I will do is go here and lights and draw a directional light first. And that's the first thing. Then I will go to lights again and take a skylight. All right. Uh, actually, I will make both movable because I don't intend to bake anything. Then, let's see, let's see what else. Visual effects, sky atmosphere. That's nice. I have the sky now. And one more thing. 
Uh, oops, wrong tab. Exponents, exponential height fog. So I don't have this black thing on the background. And one more thing I'd say, which is post process volume, which I will set to infinite extent unbounded because I suppose that at some point I will need to do some uh, post processing, some coloring. Uh, and that's it, to be honest. Uh, that's my, that's my setup. Uh, I will take this and I will start populating my scene and maybe I work for a few minutes and, uh, I get here to something that looks really, really close to electric dreams. And, uh, <laughs> uh, well then, thank you very much, everyone, for the video. Yes, uh, we have been so that, uh, yeah. that's the workshop of lighting, end of it. Yes, so uh, fortunately now I have this uh, amazing uh, senior lighter and stuff, and I can ask feedbacks, please tell me how I did. So I would say we can take a look on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go with it uh, so yeah like I will open the Electric Dreams uh, demo where I have removed completely uh, lights like you can see that is really optimized uh, it's completely dark deep dark so it's perfect right uh, but now let's go to do a slightly different workflow from what Gian Pietro has done. A more like painful one per se. So yeah, like we, by the way, just uh, to get back into it. So it's not that it's incorrect. What has been done so far is the fact that lights in a reel have certain parameters exposed. This is why we have to actually understand those parameters like Epic Games have said, okay, I will give you those parameters. I will give you those tools, use them, right? But most of the time, because it's easy as Gian Pietro has just showed, we don't tend to say, okay, so let me dive into it. No, yeah, I want to do the easy stuff. I want to do it fast, easy, easy to interact with and so on. That it's okay, but it's slightly like incorrect in a way because we are uh, adding more variables into our workflow that will probably cause us issues in a production. So now we will see why. So basically I will take a directional light as a first light. So from now on, everything is equal, right? Okay, it's yeah, workflow. I did well, okay, cool. <laughs> from now we are good. Then I can take a skylight and I can bring it in here, okay? Then I take, in the visual effects, a sky atmosphere. Damn, it's the same, right? It's working equally the same. But now, before continuing, I will likely import, I will take my uh, directional light and I will put a value in here. And this happens, right? That's perfect. It looks amazing, right? Mm -hmm. But now uh, we are also going to our skylight, set it to movable, but then we have to also set the real-time capture, otherwise we will not capture the sky atmosphere in our scene. And in the end, we set our post-process volume. And we set it to infinite extent. Good guess. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I mean, you can see that I already have some experience because otherwise. You see. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's already like senior principal area. We are there. Nice. But yeah, apart from the jokes, this is the scene more likely has, uh, Gian Pietro have set it up. 
So we have the normal actors, but with the difference that I added a parameter as a plus. That is the intensity of the directional light that we have right now. So mm -hmm. why? Why is that? I can show you in a minute. So first we will go like to set the exposure compensation to zero. Otherwise, we are overriding the actual exposure that we are injecting in our scene. And the exposure in a rear is uh, represented in EVs, EV100, okay? So another disclaimer is that we are not going to see each single parameter what it means because it will take like a lot of time. So I would say it could be probably a topic. If the people ask for it, it could be another topic. I don't know what you think, uh, Jean-Pierre, but I would likely say that that one could be a way to approach yeah, it. Yeah, could be done, yes. Uh, and then I will set some parameters in, in these EVs, and then I'll show you why. So I will set 10 and 10, okay, with an exposure compensation of zero. Okay, now I can see that my scene is, is okay, right? So, I mean, we don't have any more too much exposed. There are still some areas where it's really, really exposed and some areas that are really dark. So I would like to focus one second to the darkness. We see that this area is really, really dark. What, what can cause that? What, what do you think can cause? Something like that. Like whenever you will see a darkness like that, what will you think that is the cause of it? I think it's just the the shadows. Like I mean, we have a very bright sun, and of course, it makes sense that the shadows are so dark. To okay. Me. Yeah, that's correct. In the fact that the camera can expose one of the two, and the camera can expose shadows, or camera can expose highlights. But there is another actor, per se, in the middle of this production that is a transformation curve, or we can call it tone mapper. The tone mapper mm -hmm. is probably is pr uh, practically taking the values of a raw image and rearranging it to the output that we can actually see. So it's transforming those information. So basically, we have the row. And then we transform the row to the low definition range that is the one that we use for our uh, monitors or TVs. Mm -hmm. And we can find the parameters in here. And I really have uses ACES because it's quite a standard. I'm not saying that it's the best. It's just a standard and some of them uses it. Uh, there is a lot of debate of which one is the best. Uh, and there are a lot of them actually out there. As a tone mapper, there is Lotus, there is AMD tone mapper, there is Aces, there is Reinhard, there is Log. I mean, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. In our case, we have Aces and we have some parameters injected into it. But at least this is like my choice because tone mapper is something that we add as a choice, right? So it's not like oh my God, this is the value, and that's it. This value that I will put right now is based on me saying, okay, so I want my raw footage before I actually start to do coloring to look raw as much as possible. How can I do that? To do it, I have to change the actual curve of tone mapping. By For doing that, I have to use the toe that is like acting as a contrast in the scene. And mm -hmm. if I put it to 0 0.3, I can see that now I'm gathering more and more and more information in my scene, like at least double of them, right? Okay, so what you're doing is not actually raising the shadows. No. You are limiting the amount of contrasting done by the tone mapper. Yeah, basically the tone mapper is like contrast the, she the scene in a way that is like clipping values. By lowering the contrast, we are basically recovering those values. Okay, so by default, basically what we get is an image that has been post-processed uh, without yeah. our with our our uh, like without us deciding to do it. Like <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So if I have to work in a scene like that, uh, the first thing for a person to think is like, oh damn, it looks really dark. Wait, 
um, let me go to my skylight and let me rise it up. That's the first thing that the people do. Because mm-hmm. they say, I don't have enough light, so more light. So that's not likely an approach that can give us controls over the scene, but we should more likely rely to the foundation tools that we have. That is the lighting, the exposure, and the transformation curve that we have in the scene. Okay. Yeah, we can already see how the the thing uh, is starting to spike up in complexity like straight away. Exactly. And uh, mostly because... I mean, we have these nice drag and drop tools, but on top of them, we have another layer that we are not aware of, uh, which by default does stuff. And uh, that can confuse us because if we are not aware of all the things that are going on, we end up compensating errors, let's say, with other errors. and. Uh, that's why most of the time when we talk about uh, physical based lighting, because in every project at some point, at some point, at the beginning of every project, uh, there is a 99% chance that everyone will say, Oh, this time with this project, we will follow the perfect, uh, physical based lighting rendering, uh, uh, rules. We will not break them and stuff. And then as soon you start to, uh, work. Uh, you realize, oh, but uh, in this case, it's not quite working. Or in this other case, it's not quite working. Okay, let me compensate with this. Oh, yeah, but now I broke this other thing. So let me create an, uh, another special case for this and stuff like that. And uh, everything quickly goes like out of control. Yeah, exactly. Those are the variables that we were saying before. We end up creating variables upon other variables that makes our work like a nightmare because then the lighting art is more... Uh, a patcher than actually a lighting artist itself. So this kind of information gives us the possibility to have the freedom to adjust things as we wish, totally. That's the aim, okay? We are not here to make like the purest, okay, so the light has to be in this perfect intensity, otherwise everything will be broken. No, that's not it. We are trying to give a set of tools and some references on how to then be completely free to do whatever artistic choice we want. So that's the foundation. It's like, yes. I always make this example of uh, drawing anatomy or sculpting anatomy. If we don't know anatomy, then we don't have our forms and shapes. We don't know then how to draw or sculpt those information because we don't have the foundation. And then we will always struggle and try to compensate with lines that don't work or strokes that don't work in the actual art that we are creating because we don't have that perception of those elements and it's the same for lighting as well. Yeah, and maybe once in a while you get a good uh, a good draw, but you can't replicate it because, <laughs> because you don't know what you did well or, or wrong. And uh, I mean, that concept applies also to stylized rendering, of course, because to keep going with the parallelism with drawing, uh, every person that teaches how to draw or every person that knows very well how to draw says first, you study realistic stuff first, you learn proper rules, and then you learn how to break them and create your style, let's say. Yeah, exactly. So it and that's, always that applies be like a here process. Too. Yeah. Exactly. So we have to understand why lights behave in a certain way, like understanding the middle point of it. It's probably some, it's something that people are more and more like engaging as an argument that understand what is happening in the middle from the camera and the subject, not anymore only understanding the subject and the result that we want to achieve. So we want to be like more reliable with what we do. So and it's really important to accomplish it by taking into account all these processes yes and okay. that's basically yeah. the concept of like when we talk about pbl physical based lighting yeah. it's not Physically, that... physicality based lighting is all that one that we spoke about. yeah right exactly now. like it's not about like you as a person working in a real you make pbl or pbr it's not something that you make 
PBL, PBR is what the tech on which the engine is based upon. So yeah. if you want to work well, if you want to leverage well the tech, uh, the tools that you're using, you have to know the rules these tools are based on. Uh, and that's that what it means like uh, following a PBL, PBR pipeline. Like uh, in this case, all, all Harris has done is like going back to a vanilla state that from now on he can start to manipulate to achieve the result he wants. Yeah, exactly. And we have other tools to actually interact with it. For example, the local exposure. And that one helps us to recover values that we cannot have right now because we are limited with the range of our output that is our TV. And because of that, we cannot have a great result. So uh, we can use the local exposure. And again, we are not going in depth of what local exposure does. It's an argument by itself. But we know that by using it, we can have a much more natural effect. Okay, you can see also in the shadows that we were seeing before. Right? Yeah, because all these tricks come down to the fact that the world has a much wider range of luminosity than what a screen can uh, give us back. So yeah. we have to, and uh, what is the engine is doing is to render an high dynamic range image that then we necessarily have to translate to low dynamic range. And to do that, we have to decide, okay, which part of the luminosity intensity we want to display and how do we remap it so that it looks nice on the final, uh, on the final medium, which is the screen in this case. Yeah, and another thing is like the perception. There is a very really nice talk about uh, the, the developer that has done the Lotus Tone Mapper that basically explains how much counts the lighting that surrounds you whenever you look at the screen. Because the thing that HDR gives you is like the perception of light. So you see pixels becomes brighter, right? And if our uh, environment is dark, we can see that our skin is like almost blinding us because our eyes are super concentrated there and they cannot expose it because it's so small compared to the surrounding. But yeah, those, those are the low level stuff <laughs> <laughs> that we will see more in the future. Yes. But so let's start by something from something simple, like from where did you take that number that you put in the directional light? Yes. So there are several resources actually online, but the one that I used in this case are the one made by Unity. Uh, you can find it in their documentation. I think then we will put the the uh, the page. Yeah, I will in have the link below from for uh, all the resources that we mentioned. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's really great. Uh, and yeah, like that's where we can get most of the information that we need and. Another thing is that all the things that we will do are referenced on how a camera works. We are not mimicking the human eye, but we are mimicking a camera, all right? Mm -hmm. That's why we work in EVs. That's why we take this parameter as, as grand, okay? So, for example, if you remember, I use the value 120,000. Mm -hmm. uh, lux, because it's the actual luminosity per meter square of the sun. Why is it represented in lux? So the lux is the luminosity per meter square, and the sun is that big and that far from us that we cannot calculate how much light is emitting. Or if we do it, it would become like a, <laughs> a number that <laughs> is impossible to actually take. It could be calculated, but it's so big, so crazy high, all right? So that's why like we uh, calculate what we actually, what actually hit us. In fact, you can see that the PBS sky, all right, is 130,000, 
but that's something that almost never happens. So you have the sun, it becomes 100,000. So you can use 120. There are people that use 150. I mean, it's really dependent to the atmosphere, to the uh, area where you are. And by the way, these kind of things are calculated with a light meter, it's called. It's an actual instrument that calculates the, uh, I think, the candela per meter square. Uh, Mm -hmm. Oh, there are also the one that calculates the lux on the on the on the surface. So there, they use that one to actually see how much intensity of light there is, and it's mm -hmm. also really vastly used in photography in movie production to calculate how much light hits the actor, so that then they can like do tuning on them. Okay. Right. So it's also used for that. But that's where I got the value. So it's I didn't get it from anywhere. Then we have the EVs. So these ones relies to how many EVs you need in order to, in this specific case, expose with a median value, with a correct median value, the direct sun. I can show you what happens if I expose only for the direct sun. So if I go again to the exposure and I set the exposure to 14, 14, that's what happens. So our median value now is perfect, right? So we don't have any high exposure and so on, but that's what mm -hmm. we get then in the shadows. So we cannot recover that many details because a camera, even if you try it in real life, if you go out, you take a camera like a DLSR, this one, <laughs> and you try to use it, you will see that you will get super dark shadows. And whenever you will move out the camera from your eyes, you are like, ah, damn, but the world is not like that, of course, because the camera has limited capabilities co compared to the human eye. So they are not the same. So it's really, really difficult that a camera can replicate that amount of detail, okay, that an actual human eye does. So that's why like the parameter like the value 10 is something that I set it up okay based on the scene by understanding that the values that I have are physically based so you can see that I'm not breaking the physicality of the lighting but I'm adjusting the conversion of what I get imagine real life in real life you don't change the amount of sun Right? So the mm -hmm. sun is there. You cannot go there, grab it, and say, oh, no, wait, let me rotate it. Uh, let me change the intensity. Let me put the hand in front of it so that the intensity will be different. No, it doesn't happen. The sun is there. It will always be there. So what can we do? We grab the camera, and we expose the scene as we wish. Mm -hmm. But what we get inside of the lens of the camera is physical base value, of course, because we are in the reality, right? And ours are like physical based, all right? So it's based on reality. It's not fully reality. So then we take that as a reference, all right? So that's where it starts to come the word reference. We use it mm -hmm. as a reference. And then from that reference, we adjust it in the way we want without breaking the reference. If the muscles, uh, like the chest muscle, starts from top here, the upper chest, and connects underneath here, we cannot say, no, wait, I want it to start from the nose and then go under the, the knee. It would be like, what the fuck? No, it's not anymore <laughs> upper chest. So that's why like, we have to stick to the physicality of it and then do all the adjustments that we want like this is done in real life, then we are completely free. But why understanding, by understanding this, then we are like all good and continuing doing all the changes that we want. That's why I got like the, the idea of saying, okay, no, wait, I don't like this contrast of the scene. I want to have more values in my shadow, all right? So then I can go here and say, okay, wait, I want even more shadow. Let me go to eight, right? And I can go like that and say, okay, so that's the amount of shadow that I want to see. 
But let me check my highlights. Okay, yeah, my highlights are really broke right now because they are really, really overexposed. And I don't have a HDR monitor, so I cannot really like recover those values. Uh, how much can I go down with the local exposure? Okay, yeah, I'm starting to recover something, but what does it imply? So local exposure is a post-process and tries to lower the highlights and bring up the shadows, but it doesn't do it as an exposure does. So always make sure to know that. And there are several uh, techniques of local exposing. Uh, we will post some of them so that you can go and read them. Uh, there is one render artist that has done it for, uh, uh, how is it called? God of War Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. They have done a tone mapper and the guy that has developed it have posted uh, a blog in his blog, uh, a little bit of a breakdown of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, that one could be another approach and everyone can do whatever they want uh, on the exposure after like, we surpassed the stage of having a really good and clean base. In fact, now if I navigate into my scene, I can see that I have values everywhere. I don't have any more like those deep darkness values, but still I can see like, okay, yeah, uh, this area is quite dark. What do you think can cause something like that right now after we have done all these changes? What do you think can cause an issue like this one? Is it natural for you or is it like uh, too dark? To me, it feels too dark. What do you think? I, I think, yeah, you shouldn't see like pitch black. I mean, maybe a camera would see pitch black in that case, but the human eye wouldn't. Actually, I was about to ask, like, yeah, is there a way, do we always have to eyeball the stuff or do we have a way to measure the light that... <laughs> that we have in the screen. Yeah, yeah, we can measure it actually. So in Aria, we have a measuring tool uh, that we can find in the show tab, visualize HDR eye adaptation. So basically in this tab, we can see how many lux are present in a surface and how many EVs are we exposing the scene and our tone map curve as well. Okay. Right? Yeah, so, so I think in this case yeah. it becomes clear that we are seeing a lot of pitch black stuff because our pixels were below the the point where the tone mapper curve touches the, the floor, let's say. So yeah, I don't like know in what this to, specific yeah. case is not really the tone. I mean, there is still a little bit of tone mapping, of course, like if I lower it even more, we can see that we grab even more values. But mm -hmm. because the tone mapper is a logarithmic curve, going under 0 0.3, we start to see that the curve flattens a lot, mm -hmm. right? And we lose saturation and a lot of information. So that's why like, I usually stick to 0 0.3 as a value, right? Okay. Uh, in this case, the problem are the colors. So the colors of our scene are really okay. dark. Okay. And we can see it in here. And one, don't take it as a fix, please. <laughs> one fast way to actually check. Okay. Because this scene, all the colors of this scene are like almost the same luminosity. There are some that are even darker, like in here and in here, and that's not good, but most of them in this specific case are uniform in terms of luminosity. Even if it's dark, it's uniform. Mm -hmm. So one test that we can do is going to the global illumination tab. It's a test. It's not a fix, All right? And we can go here in the diffuse color boost and boost it double. And we can see how much it bounces more. And now magically we have more values. Mm -hmm. Where is it applied? It is applying it in the. If we go to lit lumen lumen scene, we can see the actual color that we are injecting into lumen, and you can see how darker they are whenever we see it in the normal version compared 
to the multiplied version. And we can see how many values. This one should be the visualization of the actual luminosity that we have in our scene. Hmm. But in order to do that, it must be done into the texture. Never ever use something like that. Only like if you are like in the end, 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 end of a production, like in the total end when no one wants to see the game anymore, and they want to do that, that super tight adjustment because you want that pixel perfect modification, then it could make sense. But remember, global values are always painful to implement. Always. If you do something globally, it means that you have a local issue. Yes. So I mean, always, it means always... that all your, all your shaders will be wrong. <laughs> all yeah, in the exactly. same way, but they will be wrong. <laughs> yeah, because probably here it can work. Then I go somewhere else and it's like, oh shit, that's too flat. Right? Because there are more objects that are brighter, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, doesn't work. So that's why like the color must be always correct from the start. So that's the first check. But again, this is something that we will not do here. Uh, it's just to give a heads up that whenever we find an issue, we should always ask us a question or do like a check, a mind check, you know? We go there and say, wait, so is it this good? So is it like, uh, are the, all the colors uh, balanced? Is the lighting correct? Which one is my exposure? Am I looking at any localized exposure effect? Do I have any post-processing? What's the value of the tone mapper? So you see, it's like, as before Gianbeta was saying, you can see how the curve of complexity go, starts to go higher and higher and higher and higher. So it's, it's painful, but after we get into it, then again, now I have this scene. For me, let's say is balanced fully. I have all the values that I want and I can go here and start to do some post-processing. I can open my post-process tab and I can start to add some information on the color grading side. I was tend to not go uh, into global because global again, global value, you change everything. Only if it's like temperature, if you want to give like a different temperature to the scene. But more likely, you should always rely to shadow, mid-tones, highlights. You know, I can go here. I can increase the contrast afterwards in the mid-tones. But as you can see, my shadow remains the same. You see how powerful is it right now? Like with the tone mapper, I'm adjusting shadow and highlights at the same time and mid-tones because it's changing the co or completely the curve. Now I can change mid-tones. You can see that I can increase the, the contrast and then I can go to my shadow and not the contrast, but I can offset them by keeping the values that I have. Let's say I will add a little bit of blue into them. Mm -hmm. You see, I have complete control. And if I want to change them, if I want them darker, I can change it afterwards and I have completely freedom over it. But yeah. let's keep it like uh, one second. Like if I keep this one as it is right now and I remove the change of the tone mapper, that's what we get. Yeah. So it's quite a dramatic change. Yeah. I, I was going to say that it's basically the same approach a photographer would have to post-production. Yeah. Like, when you shoot in digital, of course, not in analogic, but when you shoot in digital, you always set the camera so that it gathers as much raw information. You don't uh, care too much if it looks good or bad. Uh, you just want that information in. And then when you are at your PC with the Lightroom or Photoshop, let's say, then it's where you start to do what Harris is, show, is showing us at the moment. You start to lowering the shadows, higher highlights, uh, add saturation, uh, all sorts of things. But you start from a clean base first, because the more data you can cram in at the start, the more room to play you have, essentially. 
exactly yeah. so you you have done the, again i'm saying it a lot of time i know uh, you have the freedom to work on the information that you want not anymore the one that you have to get so it's a completely different like approach into it but it helps a lot in the end whenever you work and whenever you have a, you want to have control and then whenever we will speak about the video game part you will see even more how much is important to have visibility because that one will be difficult uh, that part whenever we will speak about video game because mm -hmm. if in a video game i have this situation right here like that yeah, and that's by the way the thing. normal tone mapper okay that's what you will get and you have some loot in here 100 percent, someone will ask you sorry can you add the light right there because i cannot see anything or in the in another case you do this you create the famous uh how is it called the uh, gopro effect so okay. the camera goes like that we go to the gopro effect with the exposure going up and down oh, okay yeah continuously <laughs> The famous GoPro effect. So, I mean, because we know that it, because, yeah, that's, uh, sorry if I introduced this topic, but that's another part that, of course, we will speak more in depth, but I think it's also worth mentioning right now. We say, okay, but wait, the human eye, uh, the pupil, like, opens and closes like a lens does. Of course. But do you perceive a continuous change like going boom, 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 up and down, up and down our exposure? Or don't you likely feel it like this going up and down or is like instant, right? Yeah, it but feels like feel uh, everything is always properly exposed unless you someone, uh, you know, suddenly shines a light in your eye. But uh, that's just a, a moment. Uh, usually exactly. when you go around, you, you just see everything properly lit, let's say all the time yeah exactly so that's the thing because human high has said like the biology of human being has said okay wait no i want visibility of what i see <laughs> okay so i want to see stuff otherwise an animal can come to me and bite my ass and kill me so i need visibility whenever i go around and a lot of animals have created their own way of adapting to light There are mm -hmm. some of them that don't even look like the same uh, wavelengths as us. I've seen uh, sees even more wavelengths because they navigate in the night. So it's like biology have like constructed a structure in order to make it work. And also our eyes does the same. So they move like they expose differently. But if we do this, we are mimicking a camera, not the human eye. That's not how the human eye works, okay? So we have to be really careful whenever we say that because these are two different topics, like when you say human eye and camera, and the human eye reproduction in CG is still a big topic and it's not something that has been done. Like even the HDRs that we have right now, the output HDR, like with cameras, with the TV, sorry, are still not enough to yeah. get the same amount of luminosity that the human eye can can take. So yeah. the amount of nits are calculating nits. So I mean, it's sorry to see. interrupt you, but uh, enough yeah. spoilers because otherwise we go <laughs> all night with this. Too much into it. Makes, <laughs> yes. makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, let's skip some from the later yeah. episodes. Uh, sure. But yeah, one thing because often it happens like let's say i have a game that is like uh the environment is this is the environment of my video game i will likely have some torch some candles that i want to use and i mean following these rules like does it make sense that in the bright midday light i want to see the effect of some local flame How should they approach the thing? Let's try it. So uh, let's put a bulb. So that will represent our flame. Okay. So we put it in here. 
And every light in Ariola has physical base value. So you can use lumens to represent it. And if we take the chart that we had before, we can see that we have also some information on how many lumens certain type of lights are actually emitting into a space, okay? And we can see that the candle light emits 12 lumen, okay? So, okay, cool. Let's add 12 lumen. And we have also the temperature of it. So we can see the temperature uh, of the candle light is 1,900 Kelvin, okay? So we go here, we set 1,900 Kelvin. Perfect, right? It works. So let's go inside of the cave. So probably in the cave it should be visible, right? No, it's not. So it's like tiny visible, you see? Mm -hmm. How tiny it is. But you say, but damn, I want more light. You will not. Why not? Because light goes in add. So it's like an addition. So if some lights are brighter than another source, basically the other source that is lower in intensity, like 12 lumen compared to the sun, okay, is like completely different values, right? And again, we will never ever get the direct sun, like 120,000 directly every time. So there will be the atmosphere, everything that is filtered. But in this case, where we are a little bit close, you can see that we start to see a faint amount of light, okay, yeah. into the surface. I mean, and it the more makes nearby sense because, it is, yeah. Yeah. it makes sense in the real life. That's what more or less you would see. Like uh, in a bright day, even if you are inside the cave, but still getting uh, light from outside, you're still getting a lot of light actually, given like how much comes down from the sun, uh, yeah. even if it's just bounce light, let's say. So makes sense that that very tiny, tiny uh, source of light, it doesn't affect a lot uh, the scene. Yeah, exactly. So that's like the whole concept of working with physical base value is because we are actually relying to those values and the interaction of all the lights will be realistic because all the lights are following a reference and our reference is the sun, all right? And in the night is how much light is reflected from the moon to us, okay? Mm -hmm. Because, spoiler, the moon doesn't emit light. <laughs> it's like a reflection of light. Uh, but yeah, like we are trying to do that. For example, let's say another video game moment is like, I'm in a cave and I want to use a flashlight, you know? It's super mm -hmm. common that we want to use a flashlight. Flashlights in real life, if we search it on Google, says that a good flashlight can go to 2000 lumen, okay? And we can see that it's more, more likely uh, an interior light, mm -hmm. okay? The interior light is 1,000 and flashlight goes from 1,000 to 2,000. So, I mean, should be doing a lot of lighting, right? Should emit. And this is the result in this time of day, okay? You can yeah. see that this is not that, that much, but it's much more than the candle. And we can see, like, how more reliable is this way of working, right? So we have the values that we need based on what we inject into the scene. And then if we want the artistic like uh, part of it, we can say, but wait, in my game, I want even more visibility. So I go 4,000 lumen, okay? And even in the daytime, if you are inside of a cave, you have 4,000 lumen and you will have more bounce light and so on. I mean, this is something that could be done, but only and exclusively if we understand what it means adding more lumens to a light okay mm -hmm. so it's all uh, on that again i don't want to be the one that is like blaming people of 
based on the values that they uh, inject in the scene, but it's all about understanding why we are adding certain values in certain situations. Yeah, at the end it comes down when you see the, the final result and uh, everything is balanced and you can actually look wherever you want because that's also another big thing in video games. Like you don't know the point of view. Like you have to make a setup that always works. And that's the tricky part. Tricky part. Yeah, exactly. Because we don't know like if the player will stand one minute looking in here and again, and you can already see that the concept of changing the exposure dynamically starts to like having some issues. It's not that we don't have to. We can still do it. But for example, by using local exposure, we can go with a lower range of movement. So for example, now that I'm inside here, I will have even more light. You see, I'm adapting a little bit. But still, I'm in a range that where things change, so you see, like it's not a flash. You see a slightly change, okay? So we can do stuff like that. I mean, you have the freedom, but still, we should do it in a way that makes sense with the whole structure of how lighting works in a synthetic mm -hmm. world, like the one here in a, in a real engine. All right, that's basically a very huge introduction to the lighting <laughs> topic. Like it opens a lot of questions, I believe. And uh, actually, I think this, that's the perfect opportunity to mention that, I mean, you guys know that I have a Discord uh, channel and uh, I will be opening a text uh, channel in there dedicated to this series that we are making with Eros and uh, where he will be able to answer to some of your questions. And we were actually thinking about the fact that uh, if we gather enough material, we could make a follow-up uh, Q&A uh, video where we go through the most common questions, let's say, that uh, pop up after this episode uh, that are, of course, like uh, pertinent to, to what, we, uh, what we went through in this video. Uh, so uh, just in case there is a link uh, to join my server uh, down below in the description and now we will make a little break I think or do you have something more to, to add at this stage? No, oh, yeah, like uh, just a little thing about the questions like mm -hmm. ask whatever you want, whatever you need again, as we were saying initially, you can also blame me Whatever you think about, you can say it in the chat there. I will answer back this time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, I mean, uh, you can go easy and ask whatever you need. I will be there whenever I can. Uh, and then eventually, if there are a lot of questions, a lot of interesting topic, we can cover them in a video, as John Pietro have said. Cool. So we will have a little tiny break and through the magic of uh, editing, you will see us straight back now. There you go, we're back. So as you can see now on my side, the practical part uh, for this video is the cinematic. And for this uh, special occasion, Eros has done yet another uh, release of another stock animation which is uh, the Slay demo. As you can see, like uh, this time the intention was to like leave unchanged the, the, the lighting result, just use a different approach aside from few scenes where here and there he decided to, to go more artistic in a different way. But uh, I mean, you can see for yourself the, the result and now we will have a comparison because it's quite interesting because with uh, his approach he also got a huge performance boost uh, on the project so it will be very very interesting so up to you like if you want to give us an overview yes so here we have our scene and we were going to check all the information that i have changed so far 
like for example the performances and a way to keep the art direction that's been done in the original sometimes i change it slightly just to give a little bit of a difference per se uh, it was just up to me and in that case it's not because it was needed and it doesn't want to be like a an artistic difference is only like more technical because in here we are speaking about technical information and we want to stick on that topic but yeah mm -hmm. enough saying because i spoke also a lot before let's go into the scenes so in here we have this shot right here okay and this is the one that i changed and this one is the original okay so one thing that has been mentioned that uh, I have changed is the amount of lights that then it just converts into the performances changes. So mm -hmm. if I go seeing the FPSs of the original and I full screen it, we can see that we have 25 milliseconds, 24. Okay. Now if I do it in here and I open the show FPS, we can see that we are at 10 milliseconds less in use of performances. And this so is it, the cart yeah. approved. <laughs> the cart approved. So you see, during your communication part, you will not have any the cards that feels like blamed by your work. Yes. So it will be amazing uh, whenever you will find a tech card saying tech card. <laughs> so it's perfect. It's a nice sensation. It's not something that happens every time. So embrace it at the maximum. Yes. But yeah, like uh, the main thing was, of course, uh, removing lights. So let's let's see the scene. This is the original. Again, and if we open the lighting uh, subsequent. Uh, again, we are not here speaking about how the Unreal Engine sequence works. Uh, we can see how many lights we have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and probably some of them I didn't count them because <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> so there are a lot of lights. They are not put it like in a wrong way or in a way that doesn't make any sense. It's just that a lot of them are a lot of details indeed, because this one was meant to only be rendered, to not go in the 60 FPS or something like that. Was not meant for real time. So only for like rendering per se. Mm -hmm. And that one was not the aim. So then they had the opportunity to add information, but still too many information more time to render so it's not really good to add too much into a scene mm -hmm. so uh, in my case i went more like easy and i used three lights basically so i added three lights to the scene and let's open the subsequence that i have plus the two lights that are in the eyes of the actual character so we have two lights plus three lights here okay and now what we are going to do is remove the lights that i added and do the lighting by ourselves okay. so let's reconstruct it so i mean it's easier i think in to go directly like showing the whole process we have the opportunity now to do a long video let's do it <laughs> uh so let me go out of the camera uh, no, wait, I can use this technique actually. So if I, if I am in a subsequence and you still want to work uh, in the scene while you are in a subsequence, you can go out of your camera right here, enter in your subsequence and navigate. And whenever you want to get back to your camera, you can check it in the perspective here, tab, and you can toggle the camera. Uh, visualization so that in this way you can work also with one viewport if you want okay, okay cool yeah because usually i suppose lighting artists have uh many many screens <laughs> yeah exactly uh we we will try to do something similar uh but yeah before actually diving into adding light 
we can see how I have applied the properties that we saw before. So in a real test case scenario, okay. Also the one before was a test case scenario, but still, let's see also this one. So I had 100,000 lux. Why? Because my sun is not directly up. So by being a little bit more set, I said, okay, still a real engine changes the amount of light based on the angle of it because mm -hmm. it reacts to the atmosphere in a realistic way. But still, I wanted a little bit more art direction and I added 100,000 that, again, doesn't break any rule, okay? But it still remains to a range that makes sense for the sun. I mean, I cannot mm -hmm. put it 0.1 lux, that is the one of the moon, and then rise everything in the exposure. So that one will break the actual uh, lighting intensity and setup that we want to create. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why like, I added uh, 100,000 lux. Then I have the post process. I don't show you the skylight because it's by default everything. So I should not put any information into it. Compensation at zero, of course. And then in here, I use mean and max EV at 12. Why 12? Because in this case, I can do something that they do in movie production as well. They can choose for what to expose. I can either expose for the background or for the foreground. Mm -hmm. In this case, I want to expose for the background because I cannot put a light on the mountain to lit more it, you know, to show more details out of the mountain. So that's why like I expose there, but it means that my foreground will be darker. And at the same time, in the foreground, I can add supplemental lights like they do in a movie production. So you see like, we are more realistic. So we are creating a boundary around us that gives us the possibility to remain to something that is believable for our eyes. For our eyes sorry. Because that's what we see when we see a movie. We see something that has some boundaries and people that actually do that work have found a way to actually make it work in mm -hmm. front of, of our TVs or cinema whenever we see something like that. Yeah, so basically, even if you are in an environment that is technically freer than that like uh, you you could potentially light the mountain with a stage light let's say but you're self-limiting yeah. yourself to an approach that is grounded in reality just because then it forces you to work in that way and the result automatically uh, comes down to something that uh, as a viewer we are used to see and uh, I exactly. mean, relates to us better yeah because then you will catch it instantly that the lighting is not natural. Even by mm -hmm. not being a lighting art, you will instantly catch it because it feels weird, you know? And then we will see also with the light positioning. Mm -hmm. After that, I have, of course, changed the tone mapper, okay? A 0 0.35, you see, like, again, there is a little bit of our direction. I could use 1.3, okay? In the end of production, I said, okay, 0 0.35 gives me that more crunched effect that I liked, I liked in, the, in these shots. And that's mm -hmm. why I added it. So okay. it's all, and also the slope, you can see, that helps me like to bring in the upper part uh, and in the middle, not on the mm -hmm. shadow, upper and middle, like more contrast. It rises okay. the, the curve. So that's why I, di I did it. Like the default is 0 0.88. In here, I added a little bit more. But that one is something that I did in the final stage. I didn't do it before working. Before working, the setup was this. 0, 3, default. That one was the initial setup. Okay, so let's start with the initial setup, I would say. Uh, also in this case, so that we see what happens with the defaults. And also the white clip, I put it into 0, so that all the whites will be represented. Again, mm -hmm. just as a reminder, you go to show, visualize, HDR, I adaptation, and you can see the values here. Mm -hmm. How they are recovered and the toe, how it changes. And then the slope, you can see how it moves a little bit more this part than the toe that crushes both of them. Okay. So it changes mm -hmm. the slope of the curve here. Yeah. So basically for whoever is wondering, maybe it doesn't have familiarity with histograms and stuff the steeper the slope the more contrast in the image 
because what this curve is doing is remapping from bottom to uh, from the floor to the ceiling, let's say the blacks and the whites that you have in high dynamic range to the blacks and the whites that you want uh, to come up with in the low dynamic range. So the higher the curve goes, the, the, the brighter the final image becomes, but the corresponding pixel in each point of the histogram is the one that is getting remapped by that point in the curve. Probably is even more confused now that I tried to explain, but uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you have to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, yeah, and it would be really cool to speak about it whenever we will go into it, into the time yes. mapper part. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff, like you represent in a lot of videos, those information about the curves and how to actually work with them. And that's that one will be cool. But yeah, uh, so that one is the basic setup. Okay. So I added those information. Uh, I don't have any local exposure. You see, I was like trying stuff, but I don't need it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because in this case, I don't need always visualization. I want to recreate what a camera does. And then if you really, really need it, you can do the slightly local exposure change. Okay. Like they do in a movie with a EXR. They take the EXR and they change the highlights in mm. the in the EXR file. So that's what they do and that's what we can do as well it will not be as precise as an exr uh, doing it in the low dynamic range but still that's the purpose of local exposure but yeah this is the basic setup now we can start to add our lights uh, so we can add our lights in the scene uh, let's say with a rectangular light the rectangular light it's what is like the most nearby in terms of uh, behavior to what they have in cinema, like soft boxes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like the most nearby way of approaching lighting that we have in synthetic. Uh, in a rectangular, we can set the surface size of it. Let's say 100 centimeter by 100 centimeter, right? And then we can set the intensity of it in lumen. And here it comes like the decision making of which light do I use? And there are a ton of them. There are lights that have like low amount of lumens that they emit, as we saw before, like the decorative mm -hmm. light or a street light, for example. Like, I mean, a street light that you see usually like making a lot of uh, intensity of light is. 10,000 lumen on exterior light. So if I make 10,000 lumen, you can see the amount of light that it produces. Mm -hmm. It's quite faint in a way. I mean, we expect a lot more light. Yeah, so I mean, that's compared why Compared to the daylight, yes. Exactly. Uh, compared yeah. to the daylight, it's quite faint. Then if we go to the night, of course, it will like poof, explode almost because it's quite bright in a dark environment. But yeah, like... Uh, in our case, we have like the synthetic world and we can add lights as many as we want. But in real life, what they do in order to save money, actually to save money, instead of using really powerful lights, and trust me, there are really powerful lights. There is one light that goes at 20 kilowatts. Guys, 20 kilowatts light, it means, it means and it was like this kind of light. This light right here, this is a fucking beast, this light, okay? So it doesn't use like LED, it use HMI, that use mercury vapor mixed with metal LEDs in quartz glasses envelope. That okay. sounds if super If it hits you, like it gives you cancer, crazy. basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more likely. <laughs> and it goes until 24 kilowatts. And this kind of light creates approximately from 85 to 108 lumens per watt. So if you take 90 as a medium value and you multiply it times 20 kilowatt, that is 20,000 watts, it becomes 1,800,000 lumens. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> explosion of light. And, and those lights are made on purpose that powerful 
because then you can see them in daylight okay mm -hmm. even if you are in the known complete clear sky you will see this light okay yeah so i would not try to put one million because it would blow out uh, everything in here so it's no sense to do it i, I mean i can do it but it doesn't make any sense uh, but another type of light that is vastly used is the 300d and is another type of light that goes approximately is a led that goes to 300 watts okay mm -hmm. and an led of 300 watts is approximately and you can make the calculation there are the converters everything online it's 32000 lumen of light okay it emits so we got 32000 and we can see that we start to have a much more defined light okay mm -hmm. So worth mentioning that lighting, of course, the intensity of it is dependent on the distance. Okay. Same intensity, the more that is nearby the light, the so the subject, the more is the light that we perceive, of course, mm -hmm. on the subject, because we have less dispersion of it. But yeah, uh, those are like basic topics. So first thing first that we want to do after you see, like now we have a basic ground that is our sun, basic exposure that is the one that we have set it up based on the information of photography that we have. And now we can start to add lights based on all this information. So we continue keeping that reference. Now we can say, okay, so my scene has this key light, okay, that is the first light in mm -hmm. this pre uh, precise case that is adding me 32,000 lumen. But one part that we have to take a look is also our camera exposure. Now, the moment that we enter to the camera, we start to see that. Okay. We start to see that everything is brighter mm -hmm. than it was before. Why? Because I added another boundary, per se. Okay. Uh, I wanted to hurt myself a lot during this test so that I can hurt you as well, guys. Uh, yes. I added a manual exposure. Manual exposure means that now the exposure method is based on camera values. Okay. And we can see it in here. Uh, let's go to 30. So I can set the shutter speed, the ISO, and the F stop of the scene. The shutter mm -hmm. speed is at the frame per second that we are actually shooting. And in this case, it's 30. And we have the ISO, and then we have the aperture that instead of setting it up there in a real, you have it here. Mm -hmm. You can see that the higher is the number of the aperture, the darker the scene gets because the lens is starting to close more and more. If I put a lower value like it was before six, the lens starts to open and we have much more light entering to our mm -hmm. lens of the camera. Okay, so these are the differences. Yeah. So in this case, basically, since it is a cinematic, it makes sense to simulate the actual act of filming the scene. So you also yeah. want to uh, add the that variable of the camera. Which camera am I filming with? Yeah. Uh, like in this case, is a uh, this one is called like custom, but is like a DLSR. Mm -hmm. So it's a basic camera and. Uh, and you have a focal length of 60 and you have the aperture of 6. Why the aperture of 6? Because I wanted a certain focus, a certain range of focus, because of course it changes also the focus, and a certain amount of bokeh effect on the blurred part. Okay. Yeah, you meant the depth of field. Yeah, the depth of field. Okay. So I can lower it even more. But then what I will get is also more light. So we have to be careful on that. You can do it, but then you have to do post-production in order to make it work after, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's always this trade. And those are only decision. There are no set of specific rules. Of course, there are some rules that you can take. Okay, based on the many locks I have there, I have to set my camera in a certain way so that that information on the face of the character is balanced and all the rest should follow. I mean, there is a lot of technicality also in that in photography is really, really technical. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we want to have a little bit more freedom and we don't want to go 
that much technical into it. Because more likely in a video game, you will never approach it in that way. But already having this kind of knowledge helps you be more grounded with what you create. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we can be totally free. So now we only have to add lights. So in order to make it easier to visualize, I will actually bring another viewport. Okay, and I will put it in here so that we can actually see it. And I will zoom in so that we don't disturb this uh, destroy the viewport here on the left. But in the same time, we can have here only the shot visible and here only the actors so that we can nice. see in real time what happens on the right. Nice. So I think this is just a basic rule to follow because otherwise it becomes like just randomly moving things and hoping that you match it what you wanted to do. You always yeah. need to have under your eye the the, the actual shot you're, you're making. Yes, exactly. So that you can have a direct feedback on what is going on in your scene. So as before, like we wanted to create this kind of direct sun effect. Okay, so the sun now is occluded in here. So because it's occluded, we have full control of what we get in the image, right? So we change as well the temperature. The temperature is, again, something that is artistic. My, many of the lights that are right now out, out there, you can change the, upper, the, the temperature of it. And then if we want to add another layer of complexity in photography, you have the diffuser or reflector that uh, adds even more light, but the diffuser changes the color of the light because the type of uh, textile tissue that is used, or the, sorry, the type of material that is used mm -hmm. changes the way the light is going through, and changes the tone of the light, okay? Mm -hmm. So we yeah. have also that variable. Uh, the reflector instead is like concentrating the light. So it's used also to use less watts, okay? Because in real life, they have the limit of a diesel engine that actually powers up all the lights in the stage. And Which, I mean, calling a diesel engine the limit is, I mean, <laughs> makes you really understand how much electricity those lights draw. <laughs> exactly. So it's crazy high. And they have to shoot in a place that is like outside in the outskirts. So they don't. They cannot say, "Okay, yeah, let me attach here." No, because you are in the outskirts, so you can you don't have a place where you can actually go and do that. You know, and that's why like they have to be like economically in place and using all these kind of techniques in order to make it work. Uh, or even like in the outside shots, they don't even use lights. They only use reflector. So they take the lights, so they occlude their actual dark sun. They take a bounce of the of the direct light and they bounce it back to the actor, right? So they mm -hmm. use the direct sun as the source of light, but reflected and controlled based on the reflector that they use. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a clever way to save money, because I mean they have a budget, so it's not for free. Uh, yeah. All the lights that they use in our case is easy. I mean we approach it, we have everything we want. We place light also at this distance, you know, in the face of the character. I want this effect like that, so I place the light right here. So in there, they don't have this kind of possibility because lights are not invisible and uh, they cost money. <laughs> so yeah. And also this one brings another topic, making the lighting being believable. So if I place a light right here, okay, now the light is actually in front of the character. You see where it is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me remove that. So you can see that we actually see the source of light, but in real life, doing something like that, it will mean that we see a blown up uh, box that is full of light. So it never happens. So what they do actually is they bring back the light. And now we are having something that is more reliable to how they will shoot in a movie production. Okay, mm -hmm. so these things are super small as an information, but they change a lot the look and feel of something that we present to people. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe dumb question that pops up to my mind because, yeah, I mean, following what you have been saying, everything makes perfect sense. But why not in this case just use the sun to illuminate the character instead of having it in the shadow and trying to replicate the sunlight? Control. So, and consistency are the two words. Whenever you change the sun position, as it has been done in the original version of this cinematic, you are changing also how the surrounding is illuminated. Okay? Or, another trick that has been done always in, uh, in, uh, in the synthetic production is like lighting, using lighting channels. Like they use a specific channel only for the characters and they lit the characters independently of the rest. Mm -hmm. That can work in a really, really stylized uh, production, but usually it just makes the lighting more fake. And that's also the same thing. I have done some tricks here for the direct light. Like, for example, I have hided objects so that the sunlight can pass through, okay, mm -hmm. that are out of the frame. But it's still something that they do also in real life. So if they have a stage built up, I mean, they don't hide a building <laughs> of course but they they hide objects that are not visible they, or that they should not have visible in the frame because mm -hmm. they occlude too much they add too much bounce so and then we are going to see also the concept of negative lighting how mm -hmm. is, it, is it used in, in photography and how we can use it in here but yeah like all this information can be done because it's actually something that is made you know what you don't see you don't care okay. you care what you see in a case of a cinematic or a movie right you care about the frame all the pixels that you see how you see them how they behave in the space so these are the important part then all the rest should be consistent okay that's really really important fair enough and yeah. that's why we don't change it so yeah, in here we have the rectangular light that we have added here, and this is our key light, okay? And then we can start adding a rim light, for example, in here. We rotate it. So we will create like a top-down light. And we bring it up. That is not visible in the frame. And we see like the angle that we want to give to it. So now we have the shoulders visible. Now we have a little bit of the arm right there. But I would say let's go with the shoulders and a little bit of the right shoulder like that. And now we can like, in this case, because we want to mimic like the sky, we can go colder with the light. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can add more coldness to the light. Yeah. It really makes it uh, pop out. Yeah, and in fact, one also suggestion could be like, instead of starting from a, a, a key light, start from the rim light. Because whenever you add a rim light, you already understand the shape of the, your character, of your subject, okay? So the mm -hmm. moment that you have the shape of it, now you are free to go and say, okay, so this is the shape. How do I want the rest to follow with the shape? You can see now how they just work cohesively because I have the key light here and only the boundaries of my shape of the, of the subject are actually lit. So it's a different way of approaching it, but with the time it starts to make sense because you say, okay, wait, so I want to see the silhouette, how the silhouette moves. And it's something that they do also uh, when the people draw. The first yeah. draw the outside of it, you know, the silhouette of something. And then they start to add information inside of, of that silhouette. They yeah, I was exactly opposite. yeah, I was exactly thinking to that. Like it's actually creating the outline first, like the sketch and then filling it in. Uh yeah, with everything. Exactly. Yeah. That's uh an approach that I usually do when I do cinematics. Uh, I try to do this kind of approach like Starting from a rim, then adding a key, 
I mean, now I have added the key initially because, I mean, it feels like natural to most of the people. But yeah, try that and see if it works also for you. For me, it feels quite natural to do it, like to add a vim, then see how it behaves and then add a key light mm -hmm. into it. Maybe you uh, just you want also to quickly go through like the meaning like rim key light basic yes. lighting uh, setups and stuff like what's the rule of thumb usually? Yeah, so I mean there isn't a specific specific rule, and I don't really like uh, if a lighting is really done like okay, so I need rim always key always feel always no, it makes it really boring doing lighting like that. There are a lot of gaffer uh, uh, director of photography that really hates doing this kind of tree setup of light. It makes the image less natural sometimes. Mm -hmm. It makes it always like this kind of cinematic effect, but not natural. You know, you sometimes put your eyes too much into an information that you don't want to give in the specific case. I mm -hmm. mean, it works. Uh, in this case, we saw. The silhouette now, the details of the uh, of the characters are much more visible, especially here. It gives some curves, it gives this kind of silhouette in here. It blends more with the sky. So now if I uh, remove it, you can see that it feels a little bit too sharp, this yeah. part right here. A bit more cartoony, this, let's say. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So in this case, it works. But sometimes, probably you don't really need it, right? So if we were like in the complete darkness and we wanted to add like a light that makes the character feels like really a bad guy or a bad character, mm -hmm. you don't want to add that, you know? You want to get more simpler, like one light, that's it. A key light, finish. Or only a rim light because you want to see only the silhouette moving towards you. Or only mm -hmm. a fill light because you want to have that scary moment, you know? With everything flat that you can see perfectly the expression. Of your character so it's really dependent on what you want to create mm -hmm. so be careful whenever you use it in a way that be not careful sorry but be mindful whenever yeah. you do it create questions in your mind whenever you create a, a lighting that you want to do right mm -hmm. yeah i think uh, it will be uh, this thing will be discussed more in depth in the next uh, episode at this point because yeah it really goes into the artistic expression through through lighting yeah so, exactly yeah okay feel free to carry on with your uh, with your setup here yes so after we have done the key and rim we start to add our fill light in this case okay so we put the light right here so Just because to go we want... against to, to, <laughs> to what you already yeah. said. Like, don't necessarily yeah. do the three-point setup, but now we're going to do the three-point <laughs> setup. <laughs> because in this case, it makes sense. Because yeah, we yeah. want to show as many details as possible of our character. So, no, yeah, yeah, I got it, yeah. Like, it's, it's like a trade-off always of what we have to set up and why we have to set it up. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, I, I was joking. Look and feel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah. Uh... It, it, it's fun. <laughs> you never do that, so let's do that. Uh... Yes. <laughs> I mean, you deserve all the insults that you get on your channel. So Always, always. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm here for that. I'm here only for that. So I said, please, Champion, let's do a video. I want to get insulted a little bit. I feel too good in my life. Please, yes. Let's do that. And he said, perfect. I like it. <laughs> please, let's do it. So, yes. yeah, uh, now that we have added our fill light, as normal people do, <laughs> normy lighter, no, yeah, yes. I say that. Uh, as, a, as a normie as I am, I have added also my fill light. And now we can see how to actually set up a, a fill light. So, for example, in my case, I started as they will actually do. So, they will do. Then we take a, a a surface like this one, a quadratic surface, and then we say, okay, so I want light to bounce. For example, they take the light that has been already placed and they only place like a white card near mm -hmm. the character so that the light will bounce out of the card. Okay. okay. So that we have to understand that the light that will travel from the source 
going to the card and then from the card bounce back is not the same intensity as the light that is started from here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and the intensity, if you remember, are the lux. So we will not have the same lux that are hitting from here to here. Okay. As mm -hmm. the one that will bounce from here to here. So because there is a decay of light, mm -hmm. okay, based on the distance. And then a conservative uh, uh, a conserve of energy from the material as well. Okay, so they they are taking energy from the light, and some of that remains trapped in the material. So the one that bounces back is lower in energy. Okay. Yeah. So it means that our field light could never be thirty two thousand lumen. Okay, because that's the intensity of our source. So if we want to recreate something that is more believable, at least we should divide it by half. Okay. Already with half, we can see that it's quite bright. So we can go even half, even more lower. And now we can see the differences of it. Yeah. In this case, you're using an actual light to do the bounce light, let's say, because otherwise you should put a plane and... Uh leave that to lumen to create the bounce but i think lumen is not yet that accurate to do that is that uh, yeah. is that the case yeah yeah exactly so unfortunately we can't but that's a wish and mm. actually i forgot that i had also some parameters in the post process that i have done in the final part of the post production in the image because it is, this is actually the role i'm okay. sorry about that okay. But this is actually the role. And by the way, let me remove the texture streaming. Little the card tutorial. I'm taking your <laughs> your place. If you want to remove the text to streaming, go with this command r dot text to streaming zero. And now we have full resolution texture. So the card tutorial finished. Let's go back to lighting. <laughs> yes. Uh but I suppose that if you were rendering with uh, path tracing, probably you would place the the card instead of the light, right? Yes, exactly. Because okay. path tracing is much more reliable in terms of bounces, and lumen has a fake multi bounce effect, mm. uh, so it's not really really reliable in terms of uh, bounce light. Yeah. Okay. So you can see now how much light we have. This is without our uh, bounce light. Okay. Sorry about the uh, uh, non having the actual uh, raw image because I had the post processing in the in the camera that then we were going to see. So this is how it actually looks without any post processing, mm -hmm. and with our raw image with the exposure set by the camera. So we can see how it actually looks. Um, now we are going to add a little bounce, but we want it to be like a, to help with the highlights more than actually helping with the amount of light because the amount of light that we have in the scene is quite good in the shadowing. We are not like that low in terms of intensity. So that's why like I will even cut it more in the half, like 4,000 lumen, okay? Because it gives me like that speculars you can see in here, mm -hmm. also here. And in order to tune up more uh, the specular, I can change also the size of the actual reflection. And you can see here in the horns how it changes, like it makes the reflection more or less sharp. Okay. And it's oh, something artistic. Sometimes they use like tubes to create fill lights, okay? Because they give you fill information, but it gives you like a nice sharp specular to show up more of the details, okay? Yeah. So you can also use that. Uh, unfortunately, in Aria, there are no tubes lighting. You can do fake with a, a, a point light. You take a point light and you make it a tube. Okay. But it's not more likely the exact same thing. Uh, but still, you can do it. I mean, uh, it's not that it doesn't work, but it's not as much reliable as a rectangular light being like thin and like that. 
mm-hmm. in this way. At least in my opinion, then some people could find them like better. That's totally an artistic choice. It's not uh, technical. So yeah, then we can decide which kind of bounce color we want to give. Okay. So I will go with something that is slightly warm because I mean, it's, it's supposed to be sunlight bouncing or our light that we have added that is actually warm bouncing back to our character. Okay. Or mm-hmm. the skylighting bouncing back a little bit. So it's a mixture between the warm and uh, the colder light of the skylight. So that's why it could not be like the same temperature as this light. So we have added a little bit more, you know, 4,300. 4, we can go even a little bit higher, like 5,000 per se. Mm-hmm. It would be a good value. Yeah, because it will be a, a warm light that is reflected by an, a, a warm colored uh, surface. So of yeah, course it exactly. gets even more saturated with uh, warm colors, let's say. Yeah, exactly. So let me change a little bit the key light because I see that we don't have that much definition of shadow in here. And I want a little bit of that. Okay. Start to see a little bit of the shadows. And if we want to have even more sharper shadow, we can use a smaller size rectangular light or we can use a spotlight to mm-hmm. be super sharp in fact in my shot i used a spotlight but that's totally up to to decision but yeah now let's keep the rectangular light i mean it works equally it's not that it's bad or not it's totally like our direction that one mm-hmm. so let's say this is the position that we want and now we see that our sunlight is not really visible right so it's quite blended so we want to give more punchy effect in this case instead we're going to multiply by two and by multiplying by two we are going a stop higher okay yeah i saw that you always uh, you never like drag around the intensity you always either multiply by two or divide by two yeah because I have a reference and I want to stick to the reference and uh, adding like, go one stop high, go one stop less. That's what they do. Like they go higher and lower. Then there are different way, like it's called T stop, F stop. Like it's, it's crazy complicated, but that's the way like I approach it. Like I add uh, double the lighting or half of it. And mm-hmm. I continue to double or halving it based on what I want to achieve. Okay. okay. Yeah, because in that way you always go up or down of a full stop, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's much more controllable. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I want it like to be in a, in a way that makes sense for me based on the reference that I'm relying with. So, for mm-hmm. example, also the if you want to go a really uh, correct stop in terms of aperture of the lens there are different apertures and there are specific numbers in order to go to a really full uh f-stop higher Mm -hmm. but i mean in that case again i took the possibility to myself to say okay no yeah let's go f-stop six that's because i like the bokeh and depth of field effect and uh, i'm good with the exposure that he actually creates Okay. okay So, yeah, you see, like, I'm going a little bit out of the boundary because, again, I don't want it to be stricted as a workflow. I like to be, like, free to add up information by Mm -hmm. always relying to a correct reference. I'm a type of person that repeats a lot of stuff. I don't know how I will be when I will get old. It will probably Mm. be, like, (laughs) madness of repeating myself. Broken disc. Yeah, exactly. So everyone already hates me. That's perfect. So that I can get all the hating that I was asking for. All right. So now we have our lighting. Let's say this is the lighting that we like. Okay. In terms of actual light setup. Now, after we did our shot, okay. Like our shooting in real life, you know, we did the shooting. We like it. We like how the 
the back is lit whenever he is laying down, whenever he moves, based on the position, the objects around him and the one that is on, on him. Now we want to actually go and do some post-processing. And that's mm. where the magic comes. Can I, can I first see the image at full screen? Yes, uh, just sure. to, yeah. So this is the image at full screen. And if I go to the cinematic view, you can also play the animation a little bit. Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense because I mean it was uh, I mean it was very clear what you were uh, trying to demonstrate uh, before you remembered that you forgot to remove the post processing because we were actually able to see the the effects on what you were doing, but now it makes even more sense because it really looks like a raw image that I will try to shoot with uh with my real camera when I when I shot in the in the real life. Like the type of colors, like the low contrast, low saturation thing is really what you look for when you are doing digital shots. Because that if, if you have low saturation, if you have low contrast, it, it means that you have more data that uh, has gone into the the sensor of the camera, let's say, uh, and then you have more room to play when you are at your PC doing the post production, which is the same uh, pipeline that uh, here Eros is basically trying to replicate. Uh, yeah, which is great. Yeah, it's very very cool to see. No, yeah, that's that's the aim of it. Like giving afterwards the freedom to actually work with it. So now we can close the second viewport so that we have a little bit more visibility whenever we do post-production. And we select our uh, actual camera before starting with it. Oops, went out, okay. So now that we selected the camera and we have our shot clear visible in front of us, we start with the uh, post-production. So here we have the glow, uh, color grading. One mm -hmm. thing that I did like globally was just adding a slightly more saturation because it's something that I lost by changing the tone mapper. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I added this slightly amount of saturation, as you can see, and it helps. I don't know how much is visible, but yeah, yeah no, it gives us yeah. more saturation. That I mean, at least I can see it now. Let's. Uh, I hope it will come through the video. Yeah, and then we have the gamma that I changed, and here you can see how I have control only on the shadowed part. You see, only the shadowed how it has been changed. Like the rest remains consistent, but the shadowed gets changed, and mm -hmm. I can change the gamma of it. Then I can add a slightly offset that's almost not visible. Super, super low. What's the offset supposed to do? It's like we are offsetting the values of the shadowing, like adding a color to the uh, to the shadow, like we are offsetting the hue of the shadow oh, okay. to RGB. Okay. And why that is the luminosity. Then in here, I started to add more punchy effect, like for example, the contrast on the mid-tones. We start to see more contrast mm -hmm. in it. And then a little bit of the gamma, and then the gain, where I added a greenish, uh, like a more colder bluish effect that creates like uh, a turquoise effect. Mm -hmm. It makes it a little bit more cinematic. And uh, in the highlights, I think I didn't add anything. Yeah, the highlights remains as they were. So you can see how the scene now starts to look more punchy, more like cinematic in a way, right? Mm -hmm. But we can go even wilder. I mean, it's all up to us. I, I can add even more contrast and add even more saturation overall, but only and exclusively the middle. Like, look at the shadow here. That's like, I'm emphasizing it a lot because that's what we want. Like before Gian Pietro was saying, in a raw photo, I expect this. I expect to have the possibility to change only what I want, not everything I get. Yeah, okay? because if something is pitch black or pure white in the raw photo, you lost it. There, there is no chance you you can recover it. Yeah, 
if your photo when you shoot it looks like uh, shit but has the information in you're good to go because you can play with it and uh, make it pop out as much as you want yes exactly that no yeah you have a lot of freedom on top of it Uh, yeah you can that's create a pleasure to see what you yeah. want uh, and that's really important like in general whenever we were like for example doing something like ah oh, yeah oh wait let me first re-enable the the film tone mapping and also in the post pro but we can override it in here so that's the default tone mapper okay it looks punchy because it gives you this kind of highlights and effects but then in here we start to lose information and if i try to say oh damn wait uh no i want to recover those so let me change the contrast of the shadow mm-hmm. you don't recover it okay so now if i remove every information now i have a fill light of course the image is much more stable but i have less less values so yeah. and this one again this one could be art directed as well you are not strict to 0.3, okay? But having 0.3, then you can do your LUTs in DaVinci Resolve, uh, the 3D LUTs, like in there you can be even more precise. But in my case, I did it here in uh, Unreal. Uh, but in there, I mean, you can do even a better post-processing than what I've done. Uh, my aim was not to be like artistic too much in this demo, but it was more likely to show up what can be accomplished, you know? Like I can add that kind of contrast that we had before, but without crushing the shadows. The shadows are there. I have a little bit of highlights going off because I added 1.5 of contrast and I can readjust it as much as I want. And yeah, I can adjust a little bit the gain. I can go down with it if I want yeah, that is less great. information and I can re-add a little bit of contrast. Yeah, and the cool thing is that, again, you achieved basically the same result, the same lighting with a lot less moving parts. So if you have to go there and tweak something, it's much less chaotic and much more controllable than uh, the setup that was there by default. Uh, It's different to change three lights instead of uh, 18 lights. Now, I don't even remember how many of them were there, but yeah. Uh, it's a completely it's a different way of approaching the work but it's something that is not new i mean in Mm -hmm. movie production that's the way they work they want to have something that is as flat per se as possible initially so that then they can go there and their own stuff on top Mm -hmm. of it yeah and that's with the post process with the actual tone mapper that i have used you see that I have the slope at the maximum and the toe at 0.35. You can see it creates this punchy effect. And then I can go here and readjust, you know, as much as wish. I can adjust the shadows, okay, to show up more or less details. And the mid-tones, contrast, and so on. You can see the difference that it makes. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I think it's loads of information for the people uh, watching. Uh, I hope, I hope that uh, you are, guys, you are enjoying uh, as much as I am uh, seeing uh, this very pro guy working live. Um, So while the uh, cinematic is going real time, because remember we improved uh, performances here, uh a little I... bug <laughs> of the demo i don't yes. know why like they have the object always visible whenever you play it but sorry for interrupting <laughs> uh yeah so again uh i mentioned it before jumping on this cinematic but uh, uh in my discord server i will uh, create a text channel where you can ask arrows uh, whatever you want we will try to, to answer and also gather uh, the most pertinent uh, questions to probably, let's say, let's see how it goes, answer in a follow-up video to, to this one before doing the second episode. 
Uh, that said, remember that the next time we will talk about artistic expression. Uh, so it will be like uh, breaking all the rules that uh, we spoke about today, uh, probably, but also following them. Let's see. We will do both, probably. And yeah. that said, I mean, that's all for today. Uh, see you next time. Thanks, Eros, for being here. It was a pleasure. And I really, really look forward to the next episode. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope I gave you a little bit of the passion that I have about all these arguments, all the lighting and how it works and why I, I behave and work with it in this way. So hopefully it has been uh, helpful for you. Mm. Let's see in the, in the next one. Thank you. Cool. Bye. Bye-bye.